Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to U.S. History Through Film, as we look at how America became a world power in the late 1800s, in part through the movie Rough Riders. Now, in 1890, the frontier closed. The American continent had been filled up with settlement. America had fulfilled our manifest destiny. We had spread from sea to shining sea. But some people asked, why stop there? After all, the late 19th century was an age of imperialism for Europeans. Um, and why could America not imitate the success of the British Empire, or the French, or even the Japanese? After all, the Japanese had transformed themselves from a medieval society to a highly industrialized one in less than three decades, then beaten China severely in the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95. Um, and as American power spread, it was mostly um, to promote trade and also to support American missionaries around the world. It was also based on new ideas of national security. In 1890, Alfred Thayer Mahan, an American naval officer and historian, published one of the most influential books of the era, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, which argued that all great modern nations had become great and maintained their greatness through sea power, illustrated with examples um, in throughout modern history, particularly the British Empire. Um, not only could a great navy promote and protect foreign trade and colonization, but it could also defend the home country um, from a foreign attack. Indeed, through the power of blockades, a great navy could even defeat another country economically without having to resort to a large-scale invasion. And the idea of using a navy to defend our shores and economic warfare through the power of blockades to defeat our enemies um, were very appealing ideas to Americans who had a long-standing um, aversion to the idea of a standing army, both as, under the principle that a standing army was dangerous to democracy and the fact that it was expensive. Indeed, a strong navy was seemed like a natural extension of the Monroe Doctrine. It would let us protect not just ourselves, but all the independent republics in our hemisphere. And so, Mahan and those who expanded on his ideas concluded that America needed a large, modern, steam-powered, steel-plated navy. Um, now, a steam-powered navy um, did have has advantages and disadvantages. Um, with the wind, of course, um, a sailing ship uh, travels for free. The wind is there, unless it's not. There are places around the earth, around the tropic lines, around the equator, where the wind often fails. Places around the southern tip of South America where the wind is very strong. Um, and of course, the wind does not always blow the way you want it to. With steam power, you can travel where you want, when you want, but you do have to be able to get coal anywhere you want to travel. A modern navy required the country um, that owned it to have coaling stations around the world, their own possessions or friendly countries who would sell them coal anywhere they might wish to sail. So um, America would need coaling stations around the world. Furthermore, America's Navy could defend our coast, but we have two coasts. Um, as a long way, a long and dangerous trip from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, should the Germans bother our East Coast, the Japanese bother our West, it's a long way um, to, sail, um, to sail to get where we need to go unless we can solve that by shortening the route. Um, Mahan and, and his followers wanted to build an Isthmian Canal, a canal to the Isthmus of South America. There are a couple possible routes. Some proposed building it through Nicaragua, which, although a bit longer in terms of distance, was believed to be easier in terms of terrain, but was also threatened by local volcanoes. So at some favored Panama, um, perhaps a rougher journey, but a shorter one. Although Panama, at that point, was a province of Colombia, um, a country that might or might not cooperate, although at the moment, um, it had granted a French company permission to build a canal, which they were kind of trying to do, but mostly dying of yellow fever. 
the, the need for coaling stations would nearly bring the United States and Germany and Britain uh, to the brink of war in 1889 over the islands of Samoa. In March of 1889, three American warships and three German warships faced off in Apia Harbor with a British warship watching to see what would happen. The world was saved from war between these three great powers when a hurricane sank all the German ships and all the American ships and badly damaged the British ship, although the British ship was in good enough shape to rescue the survivors of the sunken American and German ships. And afterwards, America and Germany agreed to uh, split Samoa. America still controls the eastern part of Samoa. The western part was taken from Germany later as punishment for World War I. Britain got no part of Samoa, but they and Germany settled some other borders um, in Africa to make up for it. Um, in the late 1800s, the United States did build a large and modern navy. By the time World War I began in 1914, the United States had the third largest navy on Earth, just barely behind Germany's high seas fleet, although less than half the size of Britain's Royal Navy. The British Navy, by law, having to be larger than the second and third largest navies on Earth combined. And America was looking for a route for a canal through Central America. And as our sea power grew, we could protect and support our businessmen and our missionaries overseas, as American missionaries had been going abroad since the early 1800s. Um, American missionaries first went to the Kingdom of Hawaii in 1820, um, and many of their descendants remained there, some as religious leaders, but others operating sugar and pineapple plantations and cattle ranches, and besides, given the choice, many found Honolulu more congenial in the winter than Boston. Um, other Americans, as well as Europeans, went there as well to grow tropical crops. Um, in 1887, uh, some Americans and Europeans in Hawaii forced the King of Hawaii um, to agree to a new constitution, known as the Bayonet Constitution, because it was forced on him nearly at gunpoint. This stripped the monarch of most of his powers and limited the rights of native Hawaiians. When King David Kalakaua died, the throne passed to his sister, King David and his wife having no children of their own. When Queen Liliuokalani assumed the throne, she tried to regain political power for herself and equality for her people, who were reduced to being second-class citizens in her own country. Um, but the uh, Sugar and pineapple planters of Hawaii were desperate. The United States had recently created the McKinley Tariff in 1890, one of the highest tariffs in American history, heavily taxing goods imported to America, uh, making Hawaiian sugar um, uncompetitive in the United States. Um, but many planters believed if they could not beat the U.S., they should join us. Uh, and many wanted to be annexed to the United States. And so in 1893, a committee of safety, with help from a group of U.S. Marines, overthrew Queen Lilio Kalani, the last queen of Hawaii, and set up a provisional government, which sought annexation by the United States. President Benjamin Harrison seemed to be in favor of annexing Hawaii, but it doesn't matter what he thinks. He has just lost his re-election bid to Grover Cleveland, um, who opposed uh, annexation feeling that it was immoral and indeed embarrassing that the U.S. Marines had been involved in the overthrow of Queen Liliuokalani. Cleveland himself actually wanted to send American forces back and put the Queen back on her throne. Congress wasn't willing to go that far, but they also um, did not annex Hawaii. And so, with no government, they were forced to form their own, creating the Republic of Hawaii in 1894 choosing as their first president, Sanford Dole, who's not the pineapple Dole, but is his cousin. Um, under a later president, the next president, William McKinley, elected in 1896, the U.S. would annex Hawaii, making it a U.S. territory, in 1898. And tropical crops did not just bring down the Kingdom of Hawaii. In the late 1800s, Americans began to invest in banana plantations, in Central and South America. 
Often in return for building railroads or other infrastructure, American companies got preferential treatment in several countries, particularly Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, and Colombia. Uh, indeed, in some places, these fruit companies, uh, most famously those that merged to form the United Fruit Company, um, now known as Chiquita Banana, and, all, and those who merged to form the Standard Fruit Company, later known as Dole, as well as the British company, Fife's, uh, became so powerful, they essentially controlled entire countries, um, economically and politically, countries which came to be referred to as Banana Republics. The original Banana Republic, perhaps, was Honduras. In 1910, Cayumel Fruit, one of the companies that would later merge with United Fruit in 1930, complained that in Honduras their taxes were too high. When the president of Honduras refused to give the company tax breaks, Cayumel Fruit hired some thugs in New Orleans, sent them down to Honduras, and literally threw the president out of office, through his window, I believe. The next president did not just lower Cayumel Fruit's taxes, um, they, he gave them a 25-year waiver from paying any taxes at all. But America was willing to annex Hawaii in 1898, in part because it was not our first military adventure in the Pacific that year. Just before the annexation of Hawaii, America had embarked upon our first foreign war since the Mexican War by declaring war on the oldest empire in the Americas, the Empire of Spain. Now, in the 1500s, the King of Spain, at least on paper, controlled half of Europe and had claims to most of North and South America. By the late 1800s, Spain was reduced to controlling the Philippines um, and a few small Pacific islands, Cuba and Puerto Rico in the Caribbean, and a few areas in Africa. Um, and a number of these places, most notably in Cuba and in the Philippines, um, many local people wanted independence from Spain and thought they could get it, Spain being much weaker than she had once been. Um, in contrast, in the early 1500s, the English had barely begun to explore North America and would not even begin to settle it for another century. But by the late 1800s, the old English colonies had become the United States and filled up half of North America. And with the frontier filled in, we wanted to go further in part because of our economic interests, um, particularly in the Caribbean, in sugar, a valuable commodity. Many Americans had invested in sugar plantations in Cuba, Hawaii, and elsewhere, and wanted to protect their investments, particularly as those islands had political problems. Um, they also wanted to develop those islands, especially Cuba, as places where we could sell more Amer American manufactured goods. Now, Cuba had launched a couple efforts at independence um, in the mid and late 1800s, trying again in 1895. Spain sent in General Valeriano Valor with 150,000 troops to crush the rebellion so brutally that he was nicknamed Butcher Valor. Um, one of his most infamous strategies was the creation of what he called reconcentration camps where, in rebellious areas, civilian populations would be rounded up to be monitored in case any were guerrillas and to essentially keep as hostages against uh, rebel activity. It's estimated at least 200,000 Cubans died due to this policy, and a number of American-owned sugar plantations were destroyed as well. Many Americans sympathized with the Cubans. After all, we remembered our own Revolutionary War, winning independence from a European empire. Likewise, American property was being destroyed in the war, and American businessmen wanted to put a stop to that. And Americans were aware of all these crimes because American newspapers covered the war in brutal detail. Um, and these newspapers of the late 18, early 1900s are described as the Yellow Press possibly after the popular comic strip character, the Yellow Kid, who appeared in some of them, or possibly because they were printed on newspapers so cheap um, that it rapidly turned yellow. These were newspapers that, to sell papers, um, published the most sensationalistic stories that they could. 
um, if necessary, exaggerating or even inventing um, stories to shock and attract the reading public. Um, better printing methods allow them to reproduce um, illustrations and even photographs in relatively high quality to further drum up interest. Um, and these were newspapers um, as a big business. Um, the two most famous publishers of the Yellow Press were the rival publishers Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. Pulitzer later felt a little bit bad about some of the uh, questionable journalism that his publications had reproduced and, and left money um, to create a prize for good journalism. William Randolph Hearst, to the best of my knowledge, never felt bad about anything. Um, again, the Yellow Press um, would drum up interest in, um, in events in Cuba. In presenting Valor as a monster who is brutal to the Cubans and who ignored the rights of Americans, an infamous illustration showed an American woman being strip searched by the Spanish authorities. A very shocking picture by the um, uptight standards of the day. No one should be strip searching our women, of course, especially dirty foreigners. Um, some people even accused the yellow press of of deliberately trying to provoke a war in hopes that covering the war would sell even more papers. But there certainly were problems, and so to protect Americans in Cuba, President McKinley sent one of our modern steam-powered steel-plated battleships, USS Maine, to Havana Harbor. Shortly afterwards, a private letter written by the Spanish ambassador in the United States was somehow stolen by Cuban rebels and leaked to the yellow press. The Spanish ambassador in America called President McKinley weak and stupid. Now, over the course of my life, I've heard every American president um, of both parties called worse than that. But we can call our own president weak and stupid. We don't want foreigners doing it. Americans were even more furious and began to call for war. And shortly after this, in Havana Harbor, USS Maine exploded. They did a quick investigation and determined that a Spanish mine had blown up the ship. Although later investigations suggest it was probably caused by an electrical failure that caused a spark in the powder magazine, so the ship probably blew herself up. But at the time it was believed the Spanish had blown up our ship, Americans demanded war, chanting, remember the Maine. Um, and this is known as jingoism, um, a desire for war for its own sake called Jingoism, after an old British song from the 1850s, including the lines, we don't want to fight, but by Jingo, if we do, we've got the ships, we've got the men, we've got the money too. And so April 25th, 1898, the United States declared war on Spain. Um, and the U.S. was already prepared for this, as the Navy was largely run by the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt part of a young generation of men who had read the work of Alfred Thayer Mahan and believed that America needed to step forth onto the world stage um, to give a new generation of Americans the chance to win the glory, to demonstrate the valor that their fathers had during the Civil War. And so, even before war was officially declared, Assistant Secretary of the Navy Roosevelt had sent a message to George Dewey, um, Commodore Dewey, who uh, was stationed with the American Pacific Fleet um, in Hong Kong, told him to fuel up and set sail for Manila Bay in the Philippines just in case. So when war was declared, he was already on his way. Arriving in Manila Bay, May 1st, 1898, um, telling his men, you may fire when ready. Um, Dewey's fleet destroyed the entire Spanish fleet without the loss of a single American life to the Spanish, although one sailor did die of heat stroke. And along with our modern uh, warships, Dewey also brought a man named Emilio Aguinaldo, um, a Filipino independence leader um, who had been exiled, um, was living in Hong Kong, but now returned to the Philippines um, with the promise that if he would lead Filipinos uh, in an uprising against the Spanish, the U.S. Army um, would help him win independence and recognize Philippine independence uh, afterwards. He, within just a few months, 
Um, Aguinaldo's rebels and the U.S. military had taken control of most of the Philippines. On August 13th, um, 1898, U.S. General Wesley Merritt and the Spanish General Manila agreed to stage a bloodless battle, um, to basically fake a battle, so the Spanish general could then surrender with honor, saying he had put up a fight of sorts. Um, Aguinaldo and the other Filipinos were left out of this bargain, and when American forces marched in triumph into Manila, the Filipinos were not allowed to march too. Um, besides the Philippines, Spain also controlled the tiny island of Guam in the Pacific, potentially a useful coaling station, um, an island so remote the Spanish soldiers stationed there did not even know they were at war until the U.S. Navy arrived and let them know. The Spanish on Guam surrendered without a fight. But while fighting began in the Philippines, the most famous fighting of the war would be in the Caribbean as uh, Americans invaded the Spanish colonies of Puerto Rico and Cuba, um, which is harder than it seemed. The United States Army was still fairly small, barely over 28,000 men, far smaller than the number of troops Valor had brought to Cuba. And although Valor had since gone back to Spain, leaving another general in charge, there were lots of Spanish soldiers in Cuba, um, and very few American soldiers in the U.S. We wanted to boost our army up to a quarter million men and to make it about nine times its present size. But to build the U.S. Army up to the size that we needed, we would have to call up the militia um, of the various states and, of course, as many volunteers um, as we could get. Now, calling up the militia of the various states would include the militia of the southern states. Um, where people had spent the past three decades resenting the U.S. government and the U.S. Army um, for the events of the Civil War. Um, but to attract Southern support, um, the United States military chose or appointed as a major general Joseph Wheeler, a congressman from Alabama, but also a former major general in the Confederate Army, who had tried to stop Sherman from burning Atlanta the only man to serve as a general in both the U.S. and Confederate armies. Um, and he would be in command of all the U.S. cavalry, um, regular or volunteer, um, or militia in Cuba. The most famous volunteers were those recruited by Theodore Roosevelt, who immediately resigned from the Navy Department when war broke out um, and began recruiting a volunteer regiment of his own. Now, Roosevelt had had an interesting life. Um, he was born in the upper class of New York City. He knew the upper class of the East Coast. He was a Harvard graduate. But while in his 20s, he had suffered a terrible tragedy. His wife and mother had died on the same day. And he had dealt with this as a man should deal with such a tragedy by never speaking of it again, going out west and becoming a cowboy. And out there, um, he had met wild Western types as well and tried to recruit both of these groups, cowboys and ranchmen, as well as the polo players of the Ivy League, uh, into a unit who came to be known as the Rough Riders. Um, and they would be the most famous unit in the war, in part because reporters always followed Theodore Roosevelt around, as he was always good for a story. Now, besides um, boosting their numbers, the Army would have other troubles, and particularly problems with supplies. Um, wool winter uniforms were sent to troops in Cuba, um, where many suffered from heat stroke. When they finally returned to Cuba um, and waited to be discharged from the army um, in camps outside New York City, they were distributed lightweight winter uniforms as the weather turned cold. Transporting horses to Cuba was almost a total failure. While the Rough Riders were supposed to be a cavalry unit, almost all of them had to fight on foot. They managed to get two horses there. Um, which went uh, to Theodore Roosevelt, and I believe Colonel Leonard Wood, um, who in principle was his superior um, and overall commander of the Rough Riders. Um, now, while Havana is the capital of Cuba, Santiago, um, at the southeastern tip of the island, is another important base, a, a major city, a large part of the Spanish Navy was stationed there, and that was America's target. Um, 
The U.S. Army landed near Santiago um, between Jan June 22nd and 24th, 1898, um, while the Navy blockaded um, the harbor after first capturing um, and setting up a base at Guantanamo Bay to use as a shelter during hurricane season, an area the U.S. still controls today. There were several small battles around Santiago. Um, the most famous is known as the Battle of San Juan Hill. Um, it was actually fought on the San Juan Heights, a number of hills um, just north of Santiago, blocking the road between Santiago and Havana. Uh, there was fighting on San Juan Hill, but also, indeed more particularly, on the next door hill known as Kettle Hill. The Rough Riders um, captured Kettle Hill after fierce fighting, although they were not the first to reach the top of the hill. A lot of the credit should go to, but typically does not get awarded to, um, the 10th Cavalry, um, a unit of Buffalo Soldiers, as black cavalry soldiers were known in the U.S. Army, have been called Buffalo Soldiers by the Indians they fought on the Great Plains, both recognizing the bravery of the soldiers whom they compared to Buffalo, and also the similarity um, of their skin color and hair texture to the hides of Buffalo. And the Buffalo Soldiers would be the first to the top um, of Kettle Hill and San Juan Hill. Indeed, the uh, first man to plant the U.S. flag on top of San Juan Hill would be a black soldier um, from, uh, from Jonesboro, Tennessee, uh, Alfred Martin Ray, um, uh, from the town of Jonesboro. Um, but while there were at this point a few black officers, and certainly non-commissioned officers as Ray was at that time, most officers were white nonetheless. One of them um, being John Pershing, nicknamed Black Jack because of his command of the Buffalo Soldiers. Black Jack Pershing was just beginning his long military career, um, but he would go on to serve in many other capacities, including during World War I, when he would be the overall commander of the American Expeditionary Force in Europe. And while there were a few other battles, both before and after the Battle of San Juan Hill, it was the key to surrounding and besieging Santiago, which surrendered on July 17, 1898. And the events surrounding the invasion of Cuba um, are the subject of the movie Rough Riders, originally produced as a two-part television miniseries for TNT that aired in July of 1997, later released on VHS and DVD as a single movie. Although, if you watch, you can see where the commercial breaks were, uh, and certainly the breaks between the, uh, the two different nights episodes. The movie's mainly set in February through July of 1898, and tells the story of recruiting the Rough Riders, training them, and shipping them to Cuba during the Spanish-American War. Most of the characters in the movie are historical figures, although most of them are partly fictionalized, usually just a bit, but in some cases quite a bit. Some have nothing in common with their historical counterpart besides their name and the fact that they were in the Rough Riders. Likewise, while it's a fairly minor point, the movie several times specifies which troops within the regiment um, different characters remember it's of, and yet those are often incorrect. The movie was filmed in Texas, mostly near San Antonio. Overall, the costuming uh, and props are good, although the movie states the Rough Riders were armed with Krag, Jorgens, and Carbines, which was the Army's goal, as they had just adopted that model of rifle as the standard issue um, for cavalry units. But supply issues were so bad um, that most of the Rough Riders um, carried their own weapons that they brought with them, or purchased uh, Winchester carbines on their own. In fact, you can see Winchester carbines in several scenes in the movie, well, again, not always accurately. Um, particularly, Theodore Roosevelt um, is not shown carrying the revolver that he carried um, during, the, during the war in Cuba. Someone managed to dredge up a revolver that had gone down with the main. Um, and he carried that during the war. He is shown with a revolver, but a different sort of revolver. Um, likewise, the U.S. Army, in most cases, since they could not get the Krag Jorgensen rifles they were supposed to get, 
mostly used older models of rifles, many of which still um, used black powder that produced a lot of smoke, which gave away their positions. The Spanish had more advanced rifles of a German design using smokeless powder, so in almost all cases the Spanish soldiers were better armed than the American soldiers. And furthermore, while most of the movie is set in the first half of 1898, it is set up as a frame story with a short introduction and a short conclusion set in 1920 as an old veteran of the Rough Riders thinks back on his memories from 22 years before. Those scenes I particularly wish they had left out as they probably contain more historical inaccuracies than the rest of the movie put together. But the old Rough Rider in that frame story is Henry Nash, who is named for an historical character but has almost nothing in common with him. The actual Henry Nash was a school teacher, miner, and politician, um, whereas in the movie he's shown as a criminal who joined the Rough Riders to hide from the law. Nothing like the historical Henry Nash, but probably based on another man, William Starin, um, a train robber. Um, who was arrested and imprisoned in 1889, but pardoned in 1897, and then probably joined the Rough Riders under a false name um, to get out of Dodge. He then went to Cuba and died at San Juan Hill. Um, Starin was originally arrested by a man that Henry Nash in real life was friends with, but who is portrayed as his nemesis in the movie, Bucky O'Neill, um, whose name is misspelled without an E in Bucky. Uh, in those occasions where it appears in the movie. Um, in both reality and the movie, he's, he is the sheriff of Yavapai County, Arizona. In real life, he was also a newspaper editor and a politician, and while the movie depicts him as a stone-cold frontier lawman, um, he actually fainted the first time he had to attend a hanging. He was also well-educated, spoke several languages, and became good friends with Theodore Roosevelt, with whom he liked to discuss history and literature. And the real Rough Riders, he was captain of Troop A, in the movie, for some reason, captain of group of Troop G. Theodore Roosevelt is a lieutenant colonel of the Rough Riders. Um, although he had been born sickly, asthmatic, and nearly blind, he had taken up exercise and bodybuilding as a, as a, as a boy and become very physically fit. Uh, boxing, for example, while at Harvard. By this point in his life, his late 30s, He'd already served as a member of the New York State Assembly, U.S. Civil Service Commissioner, New York City Police Commissioner, and Assistant Secretary of the Navy, um, where he tended to run things as the real Secretary of the Navy, liked to take long vacations, leaving Theodore Roosevelt in charge. Um, and besides being a Harvard graduate, where he'd boxed and been on the rowing team, he was a best-selling author of several books on history and the outdoors. Um, although he had tragically lost his wife and mother um, on the same day in 1884, um, a few years later, um, after a few years as a cowboy, during which his herds were destroyed in the worst winter in recorded history in the Great Plains, the Great Die-Up of 1886 to 87, he, re he came back home, although his experiences out west formed the basis of three of his many books. He then married his childhood sweetheart, Edith. Some historians have complained that his portrayal in the movie is too extreme or even a bit cartoonish. There are some scenes where that's probably true, but overall the movie captures his essence very well. He truly was full of boundless energy, endless enthusiasm, and was sometimes thoughtless of the effects this could have on others. Furthermore, his physical likeness and even his voice are quite accurate. He had a pretty high-pitched, squeaky voice. Although the movie tones down a bit how oversized his teeth were. Um, when he got talking quickly, his teeth would clack together in a way many people found frightening if he was too close. <laughs> when the Rough Riders were first formed, Roosevelt is technically their second in command, the commander being Colonel Leonard Wood, who did have actual military experience fighting the Indians in the Great Plains, and he's also a medical doctor. And Fighting Joe Wheeler is a congressman from Alabama, a veteran of the Confederate States Army, in which he was a top-ranking cavalry commander in the Western Theater, doing all he could to keep uh, Sherman out of Atlanta, or at least slow him down in his march through Georgia. 
When a war breaks out with Spain, he's offered command of the cavalry again, and making him the only man to serve as a general in both the U.S. and Confederate armies. And the movie, it suggests frequently, that this gives him far more military experience than other American officers in the Spanish-American War, um, him often saying that he's seen a war and they haven't. But in fact, most of the high-ranking officers were Civil War veterans as well, uh, or veterans of the Indian Wars, or both. Historical Wheeler is also smaller than is shown in the movie, just five, five foot two inches tall, and had a, small, a full beard as he had had since the 1860s. And while one of his sons did serve in the staff, um, his son was not named William as shown in the movie, but Joseph Wheeler IV, usually called Joe Jr. John J. Pershing is a white lieutenant commanding uh, Buffalo soldiers of the 10th Cavalry, who, as I've already mentioned, would go on to later serve in the Philippines, Mexico, and World War I as commander of the American Expeditionary Force in Europe with the rank of General of the Armies, the highest rank ever held by a U.S. Army officer, except George Washington, whom we always retroactively promote to the highest rank when a new rank is created. William Randolph Hearst is the owner of the San Francisco Examiner and the New York Journal, which are engaged in a circulation war with Joseph Pulitzer's New York World. To sell more papers, he'll publish anything, even if he has to exaggerate it or invent it. His yellow journalism, publishing sensationalistic stories of Spanish brutality in Cuba, partly from genuine sympathy for the Cubans, partly out of a desire to inflame Americans into a war that would sell papers, um, did contribute quite a bit to the demand for war. During the war, Hirsch chartered a boat and sailed for Cuba with many of his reporters and with his privately chartered boat, at one point captured 29 Spanish sailors during the blockade of Santiago. And William McKinley is the 25th President of the United States, a veteran of the Civil War who served at Antietam, a conservative Republican who supports the gold standard and a protective tariff, but who has also done a lot to modernize the presidency, particularly in its relationship with the media. He really hoped to negotiate with Spain to bring peace to Cuba, but Spain was unwilling to offer independence to Cuba, while the Cubans would not accept anything less. McKinley was not eager for war, but told Congress it was for them to decide. Congress then declared war.